Amen. Good morning. So quickly, uh, would you grab your Bible and turn with me to Jeremiah 31? Jeremiah was not a bullfrog. <laughs> Jeremiah was a prophet. <laughs> it's good to have all of you here this morning. Uh, Dave is preaching, my dad, I don't know who that was, is preaching in uh, Johannesburg at Tafara um, at Faith Hill Church this morning. And uh, so we trust for a, for a great move there and, and for God to do something really special there as well. Um, something I also just, no, we'll, t- we'll do it next time. We'll touch on it next time. Um, uh, if you're coming, ne- tonight we are here for the evening service here tonight, but from next week for the next three weeks, we're running, we're going to be at the beach 4 o'clock on a, on a Sunday afternoon, and it's really a powerful time, and I want to encourage you is to make effort and come down to the beach and come be there right in front of Ben's at the beach uh, where we do worship. Just At least just come one of the, of the days. Put your flip-flops on. Um, you know what, like I saw this comedian about flip-flops, that they don't tell you that flip-flops are like death slippers. Because you can only go forward in them. You can't turn. And if they, if they get water, you die. If you turn in them, they're gonna, you're just going to fall out. Okay, anyway, let's not. So bring your flip-flops and come down to the beach and come and be with us. We're going to have baptism there. We're going to just have an awesome time at the beach from next week on every Sunday night. But tonight we're here. Okay, so we're going to Jeremiah 31. I should probably also go there. It's quite important for me to read it. Jeremiah 31. And we read you from verse 31 as well. So this is about the new covenant. This is talking about Jesus. This is talking about what Jesus is about to do and is going to do. And it is here. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with my house Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them out of the hand and led, by the hand and led them out um, of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, which um, through, though I was a husbandman to them, to them says the Lord. Um, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel and with the house of those days, says the Lord. I will put, a law, I will put my law in their mind and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall a man teach his neighbor, for every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquities and their sins, and remember them no more. Ezekiel 36 is a similar scripture, and says, I will create in them a clean heart. Old Testament, you could do all the sacrifices you like. It did not clean your heart. It only covered it. It did not bring you a new heart. Your heart was still evil. Your heart was corrupt. Your heart was still bad. And that's why you know, when you get saved and you try and run away from Jesus, you always feel bad because it's not your nature anymore. You can try and run away from that. You can try and stop being. There's no way that I can undo my birth as Sean Besson in the natural. There's no way I can undo the fact that you are born again. And so that's why you can fly across the world and go try and stay on a a remote island and say there's nothing that uh, about God and about Christianity and any of these things. When you fall asleep at night, there's a knock at the door and going hello you cannot you can run but you cannot hide boy that's the truth he created a clean new heart you got born again you didn't make a just a life's choice and i know you know this i'm I'm just laying foundation to today is that you didn't make a, a choice of um just changing your, your dietary habits. You, you didn't make a choice of just like, now I'm suddenly uh, going to be stop eating chocolate and I'm going to go to gym on Monday. And then, you know, you know, that kind of thing that we all do, and then we don't do it anymore, and now suddenly we're not fit anymore. And of you here today, you're all very fit and all very healthy, right? But the, co- <laughs> the context is, is that you can change your mind about things that are external, but you cannot change your mind or change what is when the heart 
is made new. You have a new heart and you are born again. You were born out of darkness into a kingdom. So you, I just want to state this so you know this. And if you don't know it, now you know it. You weren't taken, there's not two kingdoms. You weren't taken out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light. There's no kingdom of darkness. There's only darkness. There's no such scripture. The scripture is taken out of darkness into the kingdom of light. And that's not a kingdom. That's just an absence of a kingdom. That's the absence of a king. That is uh, um, just chaos in itself. And now you're brought into line with a king that rules over you. One that will never leave you, never forsake you forever. So you're brought into a kingdom. Your heart is made new. Yeah, it's just darkness is only the absence of light. So when we talk about this today, we talk about the heart or what the heart is, and this is where I'm, uh, wow, that's a really nice, I like that one. We've got to put that on the YouTube one. I like that. It's talking about giving my heart. Now, you know, in all the years that I've done weddings is that you... Every single time you're there at, a, at the day that they ch- exchange vows and they're standing in front of each other and the guy's standing there and the lady comes walking, I have not seen one guy not cry when that lady turns that corner and she comes walking down. They, oh, <coughs> Even the ones that are drunk, because I've done those times too. <laughs> yeah, I've been at weddings where the guys just pop the stuff underneath the chair just before the girls come. And, they, and you can see th- this bride and I'm like, what have you done to this poor guy? And he's standing there all drunk, but when he sees her, <laughs> the tears roll down the face because he's never seen anything so beautiful in his entire life. True, guys? And the women are emotional, and it's a beautiful moment. I've seen some beautiful moments happen in front of me, and I've been privileged to lead people in that and, and bring them together. And as they're giving their hearts to each other, because it, it takes something. It didn't just happen around the corner in a quick little, like, oh, no, can we exchange a, just a little piece of grass, and we'd wrap it around our fingers, and, okay, now we're married. no. You bring it in front of everybody. Everybody's there. You exchange vows. You make a commitment to life. You pay so much money. You see, when the heart's involved, there's no cost too big. You try as best as possible to get the best stuff. The flowers you want, the, the, the cake you... Okay, forget about the cake. No, uh, whatever the music you want, the, even the, and everybody listens to you. You see, when the heart pops in and the heart's on display, then everybody says, how can we serve the heart as best as possible? It's beautiful. It's amazing. Well, then you find five years, six years, ten years, twenty years down the line, a lot of those people like forget about the day they got married. They forgot about the day that they gave their heart. And so now the exchange is, you know, here's the thing about 1 Corinthians 13. It says, Love is patient. It doesn't say patient produces love. It says love produces patience. Love produces kindness. Love produces long-suffering. Love puts the toilet seat down. Anyway, love <laughs> cuts the cheese. Love, back in the day, the, 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 the toothpaste. Nowadays, it doesn't even have that anymore. But the, the context of that is love produces something when it is the forefront, when it is the tree, and it produces that. Ephesians talks about being rooted and grounded in love. So go with me to Matthew 6. Let's read you in Matthew 6 quickly. Verse 19 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in to steal it and ADT, ADT cannot protect it. Gordon Bay security will be too late. Anyway, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust can destroy and where thieves do not break in to steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
It's interesting that that scripture doesn't say where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Have you ever wondered about that? I'm like, we, we know this so well, this scripture, verse 21, is that where your treasure is, there your heart is. But most of the time we think like, if my heart is there, then my treasure will come there too. No, it's what I treasure that produces a heart for it. It's what I treasure. It's something that I treasure. Now, I'm a little sentimental, and um, like when I was younger already, I took all my dad's army stuff, and I already got in boxes. I, I, anything that's a little bit sentim- like sentimental about him, about his, my grandfather's, my, my, my grandmother's, things, little, little things. I can't have a lot of stuff, so it's little things that are, are special. Some of you are like that. You treasure that, Right? It's not something you just let lay around. You treasure something that has all value. Most of you are that way about your cell phone and only your cell phone. Everything else can go as long as that cell phone is still okay. Where's my phone? <laughs> First thing you do, you get up. Where's my phone? Does anyone see my phone? Okay, none of you. Like I could see just the angel faces that have just, just appeared right now. True. Holiness just like, no, not like that at all. No, you, you're lying. You, there are certain things that you are so about, is that if you leave home and you leave your phone at home, you will turn around and go fetch it because you treasure it. It's something you are aware of because it has something of value and it carries something of value, so your heart is at your treasure. Where am I going with this today is a question that my dad asked, I think last week or somewhere, he made the, the statement in the last two weeks. And it stuck with me. And it started asking the question, it's like, where is your heart at? Where is our heart at as church? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where is your heart at? Where is, what am I treasuring that is of value to me in this life right now because the scripture says do not lay anything in this life of treasure or of value but we have a lot of things that are of value of the natural and we a lot of times we serve God from that natural perspective for those things for what that is and when those things don't happen the way we want it to happen we don't see the fullness of that we're disappointment and our faith breaks our heart is shaken, our life, because it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen, or it's not in fulfillment of what I want, or it takes time. I love the fact that the difference between Saul and David is Saul became a king overnight. David took some 13 years. You could definitely see the difference in their character. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, and one of those fruits is long-suffering. You know, we all wish that was not there, right? We all wish that one was taken out. Like, Lord, please take long-suffering out because we don't like that one. We want it all quick and instant, and the Lord zappeth the fruit. Yeah, short-suffering. Drive-through suffering. <laughs> patience, like, no, patience. Uh, no, no, no. Patience is one that I don't want to apply to my life. But just the context of where I want to go today, of why I'm talking about I give you my heart, is the moment you give your heart to Jesus, you cannot just give your mind and just a little bit of your life. You give your entire life to Him. Listen, the fact is you get born again. You're just like, oh, this is a nice idea. Let's try this Christian thing. I'm going to put it on the table and try it out for a month or two, three months. It doesn't work for me. Uh, That's all up here. But when this is given, everything changes. I've been speaking to different people now as we walk in this road of discipleship, different on different time periods in their life on getting to know Jesus, flowing through that that first understanding of what it is, and and. A few times this has come up, this following statement says, you know, when I want to talk to you about this, this aspect of Jesus, it feels like that's, you're going to find that boring because you've known Jesus so long. Has anybody ever heard somebody say that to you? Where, where they go like, I've just discovered John 3.16, but that's probably boring to you. Who of you have had the response like, no, it's not boring to me. It's still the same. It's still the same. You can read John 3.16 right now, and my heart goes... Why? Because my heart's there. It's not a a book I've read. It's not just a little thing that I've somewhere... My entire heart's there. So in in the week, 
um, last two weeks, about two weeks ago, I was listening to some old music, and something came up for a guy called Carmen. Anybody remember? Anybody remember Carmen? <laughs> That's really old school. And so an old song called Champion. Does anybody remember Champion? No, no. Doreen's looking at me like she's never heard the song before. Doreen? No, I can't sing. It's not a singing song. It's a performing song. Yeah. We'll, we'll get you. Your life will be changed. Anyway, the vast expanse of a timeless place where silence ruled the outer space. Anyway, <laughs> ominous they stood as they prepared. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, let me calm down. Okay, so I'm listening to the song. Man, and I am crying. I'm singing in the car. Going, yeah, this is amazing. This is so great. And I'm going right back there. 20 years ago, on stage, performing champion and singing, or doing this plays as we did as youth. And I'm going back to those moments and everything inside of me remembers like how powerful those moments were when people stood there screaming and jumping and shouting as Jesus got into the ring to fight. <laughs> and then there's another song called The Witch's Invitation. I don't know if some of you remember that song. <laughs> You know, doing some old stuff now. All common songs. Some of you have no idea who that is. You can go Google it and go listen to the song. Some of you might think that is so old. How can you listen to that? But then the song is based on a true, true thing. True story. Maria Murillo, who was invited by a witch, a warlock, who invited him to his house and said, Will you, I need to see you. And the first thing he did was like, no, why must I go to this warlock's house? And then the Holy Spirit said, well, I need you to go. And the whole story, I'm going to cut the story short, he goes there and he has this interaction with this warlock who brings out all these books and starts showing all the miracles he did and then say, but what can your God do? Come on, show me what can your God do. And that's an intimidating space, right? Someone confronts you and they put you in a spot and, and they tell you, no man, listen, I've, what has God done for you? What have you seen? What have you been in when you've seen miracles? Or have, any, have you seen any miracles? You know, you, 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 uh, go on, let me Google one quickly. <laughs> but the greatest miracle is that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. There's something greater than what that is. There's something more powerful than trying to fight the devil. It's like, hey, you can try all you like and what you've got, but I've got something that's an irrefutable truth. Is that I once was in darkness, but now I'm in the kingdom. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Is that I've given my heart to Jesus. And this awakening of what that is back into the church where it goes, where is your heart? To who did you give your heart? I, I, I see none of the, the couples that are married that like take their hearts back and then suddenly like, tonight I will not be sleeping in this house because I feel like I need to go share my heart with somebody else. What will the partner of that one say? Don't come back. I mean, that's very quiet. It's like you, you <laughs> we're not going to go into marriage moments. We're just, we're just putting it out there, okay? I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. That is not what you do in a place where you've given your heart to someone. But we want to go back to God like, Lord, I, I don't, I'm not 100% with my heart there. My heart's a little bit distracted right now on all these other things. Where's my heart at? Because... When I give my heart, I give everything. I read the first church. If you go read Acts in the beginning, these Christians that start following Jesus are being killed for their faith. They're being killed. I don't know when last somebody knocked on your door and go, excuse me, is there a Christian living in this house? Uh, if it is, please step out. We've got a, we've guys here with guns. We're going to shoot you now. But there are parts of the world where that's happening right now. Right now. Guys, it's not, we're not reading old stories from the, the 1980s or before that. Right now, 
People are being murdered, raped, killed, slaughtered for the fact that they believe in Jesus. And yet they cannot stop preaching. I watched an interview. Some of you might have seen this. Is the, uh, I think it's Lambs to the Slaughter or it's, it's called something Lambs. I'll, remember, I'll get the name now. And in the interview, they asked this young girl, um, because if you're a Christian, you are less than a dog in some of the Arab world. Less than a dog. Your value is less than a dog. So women already have less value. So when you're a Christian woman, any person, not just the police, any person, listen to me, any person can do whatever they like with you if you're a Christian. If they find you as a Christian, they can do whatever they like with you. Kill you, slaughter you right in front of the police. Police have no problem with that. Kill him. Do whatever you like. And they asked this girl, will you, t- will you continue preaching the gospel even there is a very, uh, probably a 100% chance that you will be raped for the Christ- your Christianity? He said, I've given him my heart. I'll give him my body. Let that sink in for a moment. When he has everything, you'll do everything for him because you love him that much. Because he is that much. Is that because he consumes your heart and your life and you? We are not getting killed in the street for what we believe in South Africa. And I think so many times we've just become so. It's become just okay. It's just. Oh, it's all right. Well, I'm just so used to the fact that I'm, I can worship. I'm so used to the fact of showing up in church. I'm so used to the fact that my Bible is always there and nobody's going to hurt me because I have a Bible. Nobody's going to kill me. I have the book of life in my home and I don't read it. But there are people in China who will live for years on two or three pages of this book and I've got three or four in my home, but I'm not reading it. I have all the ability to come to a prayer session, to come to church, to pray, to worship, to do something, to see the world change, but I don't do it because I think sometimes my heart is not there anymore. My heart is in my world. It's in what I've got. It's where I'm at. It's in my lack of things, and it consumes me because I don't have those things or I don't have that stuff. Well, I'm not like that one or, or everybody that I'm following on social media. Oh, I don't have that. I haven't been there. Oh, no, I have not. What will I do? Just I, mean, I, I know this, this message is not to condemn you. This message is today to go, where is our heart at as church? Because God is doing something in this decade that He's never done before. Every other decade has been something built up. And we started at this decade with the craziest thing that could ever happen is lockdown. Who would have thought that the entire world will be stuck in their homes? Come on, not in my wildest imagination would I have thought that that would have been something. And when they said it will only probably change in 2023, I heard some reports in 20, uh, that first few weeks, I was like, that is no chance. This, that's never going to happen. Come on, who, who thought that with me? Right? What is the chance that that is going to happen? And then... Now we're all walking around with masks. And we're, we've got to protect ourselves and we've got to do this and we've got to do that and you can't go there and, you be, and everything changes. And what is the greatest thing that the enemy does? Is he separates us from each other. He takes community away. He makes us so used to just who we are. And what does he do? He crimps your world. He shrinks it down to just you and your family and your home and your dogs and your cats and your, and your, and your parrot. <laughs> Sleepy or Barrett. <laughs> and he just scrunched it down to that, and so I'm just aware of that. And I'll say, it's just a goat fussy. But then he looks, hello, clip. Hello, clip. <laughs> I don't know where my mind went with that one. We just, that's what the enemy does. And so we're, we just, we. We're dead to that. We're dead to people. We walk past people. We don't chat to people. We don't speak. You talk to me, how are you doing? Oh, you're talking to me? Have you seen that? Have you recognized that? People don't greet each other anymore. People don't talk to each other anymore. We find little pockets of that, but the, the bigger part of the world has been shrunk down to just these limited, 
few people that are trying to be sort of online, we're going to connect. And young people are dying and committing suicide because they're struggling with depression like never before. The southern suburbs and, and northern suburbs of Cape Town is flooded at the moment in schools with children with depression and suicidal thoughts. So if this is so good and this is the new norm, guys, we have got to shake some things up because we cannot live that way. We cannot be that way. There's too many just hearing of kids who are committing suicide and they're 13, 14, 15 years old. That is, that is not God's plan. That was never His plan. And the church cannot be something like, okay, I'm just going to look after me. Now, these guys were being killed, and they were going out preaching the gospel. They were being beaten up. Paul and Silas, listen, guys, you've had enough. We're going to beat you up. We're going to rip you to pieces, probably close to killing. Stop preaching. Yeah, we'll stop. Can I tell you about Jesus? (laughs) Can I tell you about Jesus? My back is still bleeding from last night's whipping. I don't want to go to that place, so I'd rather do it right now. I'd rather have a different view about my life. I'd rather put my heart, of course, where my treasure is, there my heart will be. That's where God is. That's what God, He's given me a new heart and a new mind and a new life. What I have is like Him. Something about that's got to shift in the way we live this life because this life, right now, God wants to do something greater, but He's waiting for you. And I want to just quickly put this, and I'm going to end with this. God's not going to do it through single people standing on a stage. He's doing it through His body. This, the time for the superstars is done. This, we had great men of God. Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lake, William Branham, um, all these wonderful men and women of Quibus van Rensburg, phenomenal people who used to preach and thousands of people got saved. Billy Graham, um, Reinhard Bunker, yes. Million people standing in front of him. That was, that was amazing. And common. <laughs> That's gone. God's not going to do it that way. He's going to do it through his body. He wants the fingers to work. He wants the feet to work. He wants the legs to work. He wants the ears to work. He wants you to be the flavor of what he is in your life. That where you're at and when you walk and when you talk, it's flowing out of you. Why? Because my heart is there. It's in my treasure. It's in who he is. It's in his presence. It's what God is. Because that's flowing out of me. And God's going to send those people. And you're going to be doing it within your school and within your workplace and within the restaurant and wherever you're at. Not because you have everything and you know everything. Stop waiting for that to like, yeah, but I don't know the scriptures. Do you know Jesus? Just introduce him. That's all. That's actually that simple. That's where your heart is at. Like, can I introduce you to the one I'm in love with? Can I just introduce you to this Jesus? Like, I don't have it all figured out, but I know he has. I don't know everything about him, but I know he's teaching me every day. Can I just introduce you to this Jesus? Because it's going to change your world. It's, it's a rock you can build on. It's the life. It's the heart. I once was in darkness, but now I'm in a kingdom of light. Because I, I love studying the Word of God, and I love teaching the Word of God. And I know that we need to believe and, and spend more time in the Word of God. But what God is doing in and through us It's not based on how much you know. That doesn't mean you shouldn't read this. But what God wants to do is not based on that. It's based on you putting your heart in that. And it's just flowing. I've sat around too many people that are just Pharisees. Just plain and simple Pharisees. People that are just, you, haven't, you, don't, you don't say it right. You don't do that right. You, you're wrong with that. This is not right. I, I'm done with that. Yes, there's something we believe in what the Word is. But the world out there doesn't know about our little infightings. The world out there needs Jesus. They need to see people's heart is sold out to Him. A 
girl that sits on a front camera and says, well, if they're going to rape me, I'll even give my body because I've given him my heart. I've given him my heart. Can you just close your eyes for a moment as we finish? This morning is not something to condemn you, make you feel bad. This morning is to stir something in your heart. It's to stir your heart. Mark chapter 12 says, Love the Lord God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. This morning I feel the Holy Spirit calling us back to that, that first love. I feel this morning the Holy Spirit going, Just put your treasure with me. Just turn your heart back to me. Just stir up that flame. You don't have to know how everything's going to fall in place or how, how it's going to be or what it needs or uh, I don't know how I can do this or I don't have time for that or this is that. or That is not the point today. I'm not trying to get people to be more at church or to try and be you serve more or do more. That's not the point this day. And I don't think that's the heart of the Holy Spirit the heart of the Holy Spirit today is I want your heart. I want all of you. I don't want 10% of you. I don't want 90% of you. I don't want 99.9%. I want all of you. That's all. That's the message today. I want all of your heart. The rest, the Holy Spirit will sort. It's not me. I want all of your heart. Lord, I just release that over everyone here today. Touch them. Stir this in their heart, Holy Spirit. And may we see a church on fire for you that touches our city. That we'll see hundreds of people saved. That the soul are lost. That we'll go into the nations for you, Lord. That we'll go into those places that nobody else will go. We'll go there because we're sold out to you. We're going to see our neighbors change. We're going to see our city change. We're going to see our country change. I thank you for that today, Lord. And I bless everyone in this place. Thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.